Thanks, Catherine. Alrighty. So I've also added the option for people to share their screen. Okay. If you wanted to test that out. Yeah. Why don't I share? And then, uh, and then I think we're going to work off, you know, the same PowerPoint, but mm -hmm. I can kind of be the navigator on the, on the screen. Yeah. Maybe I should share, let me, let me share just a Google Chrome. There we go. Awesome. And you can see questions and stuff. Cool. Mm -hmm. So for you guys, if you guys see questions, if you guys can kind of watch that um, and then interrupt or whatever, if you think we need to hit on those. Where will, where will they pop up again? Just on the bottom of the screen. At the yep. top right there, that Q and A thing, or somewhere else. Sometimes it could be on the bottom near the chat, or where you would see participants, or like you said on the right. Okay. Go. Yeah, I think Luke. After you get through a certain certain space, you can definitely kind of encourage questions, maybe, or just say, "Feel free to ask." Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we only got, um, you know, if we do a couple minutes per slide, some of them yeah. will be very quick and I'm going to, I'm going to get involved you guys in almost every slide. So don't be shy to jump in. Luke, we'll have you just start with your PowerPoint and sharing your screen the whole time then. Okay. Um, Cause I just had a intro slide just like you do on the front. So that is all good. And then we don't have to mess with going back and forth. Sounds good. Let me see if I can. So our, our viewers are probably looking at the slide then not are all, are all of our pictures. Or are they seeing us and the slides? So right now I have it set to gallery. So they will see the slides and all of you guys at the top of their screen. Okay. You think that's good? Yeah, mm -hmm. either way, I mean. We don't have too much. Well, uh, got some. We got some headings underneath there. Should I put it? Put this thing on the right side. Yeah, if you'd want to. That's better, maybe. Let's see if I can. Uh, go left side. Chili, you there? back on here, Chili? Yeah, I think so. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. More bottom. Is that better? Is Scotty here and he's just going no video? There he is. There he is. Scotty, we got to get your No, picture. I'm here. No, thanks. It's okay. I don't need a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Director of Speed needs a picture, I think. Certainly for next Probably. Week. I'm so fast you can't see me. Nice. You guys don't need to. Ripper, you dressed up. No, I wore this to work, bro. You shaved too. I did shave. That was weeks ago. <laughs> did, you find any, did you find anything in there? No, you know, the freaking gray comes out on my beard. I'm just trying to look you 20 got years a little younger. Salt and pepper. Turned 40 this year. It's a thing. Nice. Yeah. John, you, you turned 40 this year? Not yet. I got one more 39 or right till November next year. Chili, what, what about you? you? Uh, I'll be 50 this summer, boys. I get to move up a box. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> senior Open champion. Can you play in the Senior Open when you turn 50? Uh, August 11th. Mm. I know I can play in the CPC senior at 49, but I don't know about the other stuff. 
So you're going to play in the. I guess you'll it's play at in the, uh, the you know, senior section championship. Yeah, that one's at. Uh, uh, where was Coley at? Uh, over in, in Wisconsin. Uh, New Richmond. Yeah, New Richmond. Yeah. Perfect. Which is perfect. <laughs> that is perfect. What gets through seniors, four or five? I'm not even sure. I don't know how many they take. Depends. Depends on the venue. Your audio is pretty jacked up, Scotty. Or is that just on my end? Sounds the same to me. Let me try something. Is that better? Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, now you have to listen to the screaming kids. <laughs> I'm at work, so me? who's got that going? I'm muting. <laughs> That's what is Susanna. Susanna! <laughs> Not happy. I was thinking of bringing my dog into the frame, add a little something. Mm hmm. Should bring him in for the question answer portion. Yep. Who does he cruise? Does he cruise around or does he hang with you or Court more or what? Mm, he's pretty attached to Court, but he likes when I come home. <laughs> Take him to the range this summer or just too little and wild? Yeah, I might. No, he's pretty well behaved. Good. We sent him to this like crazy dog camp nice have you guys played that stadium course out there they just got done on where in california and palm palm springs oh no uh -uh. Looks pretty nasty. It wasn't easy. Those guys no. beating it up. Yeah, it looks nasty. How's this? Just a yeah. dream. Twentieth century. So, Luke, you're going to have to lead us. You don't get to see anybody. You kind of just got to talk to the screen. Handle that. I can see you guys down there. I mean, for the, the other. For what? 70. She said there's 70 total. Oh, okay. That's mm -hmm. good numbers. That's good. That's good start. Can you tell us when, when, when we Friday have a hot mic? 14. <laughs> On Friday afternoon, we had how many? 14. Wow. Nice. Um, hey, question for you, uh, Kaylee. Yep. Did, did we, we sent this out to Soda Series? Did we send it out to Players Tour people too? Yes. Okay. So so it's, our whole database oh, cool. of um, 2020 Soda Series people. Nice. And Good. then, yeah, I sent them to the website so they could register for the Zoom info. Nice. Um, and then uh, if somebody stumbles across this, I know I was looking on the website. <laughs> Is, mm -hmm. it, is it something that's pretty easy to find on the website? I looked on it and I wasn't exactly sure where to go to sign up. Yeah. So as of now, we put it under the about tab okay. um, and we're in communication to try and figure out a better spot for that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, as of now, the education series has its own website page, which I was a huge proponent for. So we're working on it. Got it. Cool. And then currently all of our links on junior golf socials will go right to that page too mm -hmm. it's on web page you said yep okay and that's it's a link through the junior pga web page yep right to the spot where they can register for each session yeah i mean whatever you guys think is the absolute easiest foolproof way for them to be able to hop on totally um 
if I had a little bit more, I would put it in a different spot, but we're working on it. Yeah, I think make it visible on the website as you click. Because mm -hmm. we don't have anything else going on in the winter. So I think if somebody goes to the Minnesota Junior Golf webpage, that should kind of jump out at them. Totally. Yeah, uh, and I've gotten a couple of questions. We are recording this whole thing. So yeah. Um, when did that start? <laughs> yeah, right exactly. now. <laughs> I got we got what you did on tape, Brent. Oh, man. <laughs> Did you put in a chew? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> are they are the kids on, Kaylee? Nope. I'm okay. still in practice mode. Okay. Huh. <laughs> yeah, not not so. Sorry about that. Jesus. <laughs> I know better. Oh. Okay. There's some good kids though. I looked through the register list of kids. So some good kids on good and so, drew tdx drum is coming on too drew dog <laughs> oh. god he dms me the most random stuff don't tell him that <laughs> okay he dms me like i'm a stranger though so Seriously. Club. i'm like drew bro what's up he always says his name like you don't know who it's from yeah I saw on Zoom, I just got a, a Zoom membership because I think we're going to need it. You can, there's some Zoom capacity to do like live social media as well. Yes. So um, we should explore like doing an Instagram live on that if that's mm -hmm. doable. Are you familiar with that? Not as much as I would like to be, but I'm definitely willing to explore all that yeah i mean if we could get that thing going we could do some interactive stuff where we're all together and somebody's hitting balls and we're all doing stuff totally we need some bryson ball speed though yes let's get weird <laughs> Trick shots. get angry right. so seven o'clock i am gonna start welcoming people in all good already great yep it's show time All right. Kylie, you there? Yep. Kylie, um, should we wait a little bit or should I kind of get started here? Yeah, we can wait a little bit. Let's maybe two or three more minutes. We're at like 50%. Right. Wait a few then. You guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. I, my my little guy Gus has a birthday today. He turned three, and, and uh, he's had an exhausting day, and he's a little worn out. So, hopefully, he doesn't come in. Yeah, the this should help. You don't get as much background noise. When are you defending, Luke? Wednesday. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. I don't let you fail if you make it this far. So that's what I'm banking on. <laughs> what happens? Well, <laughs> you really embarrass your advisor if you screw this one up. <laughs> on the advisor to make sure you're ready. So be good. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We are so excited that you're here for the Minnesota Junior PGA Education Series. We have some awesome guests for us tonight who will be speaking to us just to introduce everybody and the whole program over the next couple of weeks. If you have any questions, please feel free to let us know by typing in your question and uh, we'll get to that as soon as we can. Um, but for now, I'll just hand it over to Impact Golf. Hey guys, uh, thanks for jumping on tonight. Uh, this is, you know, a first thing that we've we've done together. I'm going to give you guys a little background on the group, talk about who's in it, and then we're going to jump right into uh, what it's all about. So, my name's Luke Benoit. And I'll I'll kind of be guiding this ship tonight a little bit, um, but I'm going to call on my colleagues quite a bit, so you'll definitely hear from them. 
And again, we want this to be interactive. So if you have questions, feel free to type them in and we'll try to hit them, you know, maybe, maybe halfway through or even on a relevant topic, um, you know, we'll have these guys certainly stop me. And then at the end, we'll have some cleanup time. Um, I expect this to be, you know, fairly interactive as much as you guys want it to be. So a um, little background here. Um, this is about us. Now I've got uh, the four main teachers here, and then I've got another guy, Scott. Uh, Scott, we don't have a picture up yet, but Scott's going to be kind of our our uh, administrative guy, and uh, he's going to be the future Minnesota PGA president. And Scott was head pro at Summerby. Now he's working for Ripstick, so he's not his picture is not up here, but I'm just going to mention him right away. He's going to help us a lot. He's got some good background and foundation work. Scott started a foundation up near Minnewaska where he was the head pro to uh, provide. Um, basically junior golf for free for all the kids in that area. And um, so we knew we need to get Scott involved as well with this program. So I start at the top here, Eric Childs, Eric's in the middle here. Um, top left. I've known Eric for a long time. Eric and I, uh, I've learned a lot from him. He's a great, great teacher and he keeps it really simple for teach for, for his students. He's great at teaching ball flight. He's an excellent short game. Uh, guru, if you want to know about short game and how to get it up and down, he is the best in the business. Um, but he's really good at swings in general. And and one thing I really appreciate about Eric is he is chilly, as we call him. Is he's super honest with you, and he'll tell you exactly how it is. And and um, as you'll get to know us, you know, we kind of balance each other out a little bit. So, uh, Chili, you might give us a little background on your kind of teaching background and maybe um, kind of what you're looking forward to bringing to Impact Golf. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Hey, uh, I've been doing this for, I think this is year 24. I've been teaching golf. I've uh, been a member of the section for what I'm coming up on 20 years. Um, uh, like, like we said, I kind of, I don't specialize in short game instruction, but in the metro area, I'm kind of getting pigeonholed as the short game guy, which is fine uh, because I find if people want to shoot lower scores, the quickest way to do that and the easiest way to do that is to work on your short game, get better at putting and chipping and, and everything around the greens and from a hundred and in. Um, but I also do do other things. Uh, I taught for Hank Haney and ESPN. So that was when Hank was Tiger's uh, coach. So that was pretty cool. Got to see some really neat stuff back in the day. Um, but I'm just here to help out. I love teaching golf. Um, I've had a lot of bad days on the golf course, but I've never had a bad day teaching golf. Uh, so I absolutely love that. So if anybody has any questions for me, uh, just let me know. Happy to help. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Chili. Um, and if you ever get the chance to play with Chili and watch his game, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. He always wants to hit it farther, but the guy is unbelievable at hitting greens and reg and getting it up and down. So um, fun to watch. Um, and I got John Rigstad. So I would, I would say John, um, one of, one of my greatest, greatest friends here as well. Um, John, I would say had the original idea for the impact golf group. So I'm going to let John talk about that a little bit, but first I'll just say, John taught me a lot about, uh, the golf swing and really how to release the club. He's kind of got a little one plane background, which means, you know, a lot about how you release the club and kind of, um, you know, how high your hands are and all that stuff. I think it's all really cool. Um, he's director of instruction at Keller Golf Club, and he's got a place in uh, downtown St. Paul. So go ahead, John, tell us a little bit about your background and kind of where you thought about this impact golf group. Yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. Super excited to have the opportunity to work with this group and be in front of you as well. So not quite as long as Chile. I've been at it for 12, 13 years, um, but love the game. Like Eric said, love to play, love to teach. And yeah, a couple of years ago, we uh, came together as a group. So Luke, Scott, Brent, and Eric are all good friends of mine and just wanted the opportunity to, to work with them in a certain capacity. I actually got to work with Brent for a couple of years at Troy Byrne prior to us kind of branching off into more specialized teaching. But um, love the game, love the education. I always wanted to learn get better, get better playing, get better teaching. And uh, this group specifically has just great teachers, all of which 
to a degree have mentored me and I've learned from Scott is one of the best uh, pros in the state as well. So very excited to get in front of people, to learn from them, to show you some things. And impact specifically is, is to work with the juniors, um, to talk and get in basically conversations about how you get better, whether that's swinging, whether that's playing. Uh, we have a lot of different thoughts and options and yeah, just excited to get going and happy that you've joined us tonight and we'll talk some more. Like Eric, I'm always free if anybody has any questions. I'm over at Keller and I look forward to tonight. Awesome, thanks John. Uh, next is Brent Snyder. I've, I've known Brent a long time and um, Brent is, uh, I'm gonna just flat out say he's the best player in our group and he's an amazing teacher. He coaches a lot of great players. Uh, Brent's been a uh, three-time Minnesota PGA Player of the Year. I played a lot of rounds with Brent, and, um, you know, when I hit it in the fairway, I spend a lot of time with Brent. When I don't, <laughs> I don't see him much because he's down the middle. He hits it straight. Um, it's really impressive uh, playing with him. And then his teaching style is uh, such a good catch-all for great players, um, so he has a lot of success with that. So, um, Brent, tell us a little bit about your background and what you're looking to contribute. Oh, thanks, Luke. Uh, hi, everyone. Glad to be here. The joke, of course, is if you don't hit it hard enough, you can't get it too far offline. So maybe that's why I keep it so neutral. Man, I, uh, I'm just thrilled to be a part of this thing, this whole impact golf idea and trying to get in front of as many people as possible and help as many people as possible. That's what this whole thing is about, is just trying to find ways to help more people. Um, Nothing too fancy. I, I absolutely love the game and I love people. Um, the whole idea is about serving people and it's all about relationships. Some of the golf stuff is actually sort of the easy stuff. Um, as time has gone on with my career and uh, worked with, you know, PGA Tour players and elite college players and elite amateurs and elite juniors, I've realized that um, there's so much more um, to, to helping people and there's so much more than a golf swing and to be around such unbelievable minds in this group and have some really, really sharp golf swing people. I'm, I'm just humbled to be a part of it. Um, my backgrounds, man, I grew up wanting to ski. I was an extreme skier. I was recruited to play soccer. Golf was kind of secondary. Um, I started teaching. I knew I wanted to serve people. I started teaching right out of business school in 2002 and uh, it kind of took off from there. I got tied in with Sea Island, Georgia. Uh, which is kind of a hotbed for a lot of really sharp people and a, r a lot of really, really good players. So I was around tour players for quite some years and um, the education comes pretty fast when you just surround yourself with uh, different types of people. And I think that's a big part of what we're trying to do is uh, make this dialogue and make this open so the, the relationships can, can really help you, all of you. So you can learn more about us and uh, most importantly, we can learn more about you. Brent Snyder Golf uh, is out of Troy Burn. We I've been there now. I'm going into my 14th year, I think, and uh, we've got a great section. Um, you know, this our, our junior program in general is a model for a lot of the sections around the country, and I think this addition with everything that's going on, and the lack of school and school changing and being in and out and hybrid learning and everything in between, um, we just wanted to get in front of you guys and be more available. So these next, I think, eight, nine plus weeks here, we're going to have a variety of topics that uh, Luke will talk about. And that's all we're trying to do is just being as engaged as possible. Just try to be in front of you as much as possible. So I can't, um, the point about Q&A and like getting in there, like don't be shy at all. Just throw anything down and uh, interrupt us at any point and we'll uh, try to answer all of your questions. Thanks so much. Luke. Luke, speaking of, we've got our first question tonight, and I want to take it. Do it, Scotty. <laughs> so the que questions from Jetson Conley. Thanks so much for doing this amazing panel. How can I make it more fun? He loves to play, and I love to play with my five-year-old. Any fun games we can play while on the course? Well, I think I'm perfect for this since I've got two six-year-olds, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, just do whatever – it is to get out there and have fun. Maybe it's you hit some shots, you play in a bunker, you putt on the green, you just hit a tee ball. It's, I think, just getting them comfortable out on the golf course and knowing that it's not like work 
it's all about having fun, even just driving around in a cart. So I'd say that's the number one rule when you, when you're dealing with, especially younger kids, make sure that it's fun or else they're going to be like, yeah, I don't, I don't ever want to go to the golf course. Uh, would you guys agree with that? hundred percent. hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. I, I wouldn't drag, I wouldn't drag them on the leash there. Right. Just make sure mm-hmm. they want to go and no, it's great. It's great. Yeah. I don't believe that you need to develop golf skills at a young age. I mean, um, my background's in motor learning and I'm telling you guys that the skills you need up until age six or eight are not important for golf. It's about learning how to run and throw and, um, move your mass and be athletic. Those are way more important than playing golf. So golf should just be all fun on the golf course. And if you got to hold it cross-handed or with your toes and get in the hole, great, get her done. You know, not, not that important to have great instruction at an early age can help if the kid's ready for it, but you just got to get out there and have fun. So, all right. So Scotty, any more on your background you want to share? I, I, I'm going to just say, you know, I've, I've known Scott um, for a long time. Uh, Scotty used to play too with long. a wooden five wood. And we go back to, we were about 10 or 11 and Scotty and I, um, I, I think we were 12 when we played 63 holes walking in one day. That's for sure. So we guarantee has anybody else done that yet? I mean, that's when you really love it. Um, you don't have to go nuts like that. My feet hurt for a week after that, but it was fun. Um, and I learned a lot from Scott. And uh, what else do you have for us, Scotty? What's your background? Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, uh, I've been in the golf business 18 years. Um, I've, I've gotten really good at golf. I was never good at golf growing up. I, I could play, but not, uh, I mean, some of you have, have shot better scores than me when I was 20. I probably didn't break 80 consistently until I was 21. So, um I'm here to show you. I think Chili would agree probably a lot like me. A lot of hard work and determination can get your golf game to where it, where it needs to be. Um, and each year my goal is just to get better and better. And, I mean, surrounding yourself with instructors or people like this, it's, it's easy to learn things and absorb things. And, um, yeah, ultimately – uh, it's, it's all about having fun for me. I love to compete and I love to have fun. I have four kids, like I said, and that's, um, why I'm stepping away. I was a head pro for the last eight, nine years. And now I'm going to work at Ripstick, hopefully make everybody faster. That's why I'm the director of speed. Um, and yeah, I was a runner back in the day too. So I was fast in longer distances, not in short distances, but, uh, yeah, excited to be a part of this group excited to help you guys out. Let's have some fun and let's learn some things in the process too. And uh, you know, I think one thing you guys are going to find out about our group is we can all play at a pretty high level. Every one of us has been a scratch or better for 20 years and I think we can easily play competitively. Some of us don't play as much as we'd like, but um, you know, I think that, that playing background really comes in you know, uh, as you get into tournaments and you're playing at a higher level, it's all about getting out of your comfort zone and talking about that and uh, being with somebody that knows that background can really help. So uh, my background, you guys, I grew up playing. I love golf. Um, from age 13, I started playing and I was absolutely hooked. I think I played 150 rounds a year for the next, you know, five, 10 years or so. Played college golf, played a little bit of mini tour golf a couple of years, uh, found my way into teaching. Um, and I'm at Interlock and love my job, teach a lot of great people. Um, and then founded a company called Ripstick, which has been really fun where Rip Golf is the name of it. We're, we're selling speed training tools. We're gonna talk to you guys next week a lot about how to develop speed and power and working out. So you can look forward to that. Um, and I've got an academic background. I'm actually um, not a doctor yet, but uh, it was supposed to happen today. It got delayed, it's Wednesday. I'm gonna defend my dissertation. So that's kind of, uh, where you're going to see some big words and my colleagues always tell me dumb it down. So if it ever gets to be a little too much, let me know. Okay. Leave some uh, questions in there. All right, let's move on. You guys got a little bit of a, a taste here. Let's talk about our mission. Um, it's all about opportunities. I think you guys already got a flavor for it. So we believe in providing opportunities for everybody that wants to play the game. And I think us five, we probably had it relatively good in terms of opportunities you know, I didn't have a whole lot of lessons as a kid, and I don't know if our group in, in general did. I don't know 
Um, you know, if we're all private country club kids, I certainly wasn't. Um, but we want to make sure that anybody that wants to play golf has opportunities to learn and play. That's what this is all about. So we're going to host tournaments. We're going to do golf camps. Um, and we are going to basically have a foundation where if you need help making it happen, we're going to cover it for you. So just know that that's what it's all about. Um, we have, we're well connected in the business community. We have a lot of great students that have enough, uh, financial support to make this happen. So that's a big part of what we're doing. Um, our experience, we talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, that I don't want to go into that too much. Um, we've got a lot of variety of skill sets here. And then, you know, the, the success of our students, I think is an important thing to think about. You know, we've had four plus million dollars in scholarships through all of our teachings. Um, lots of state champs. We're counting it up over a thousand competitive wins of our students. Um, you know, a lot of players playing, you know, web.com or corn Ferry and PJ tour events, a lot of college tournaments. And then what's really cool is uh, like rig Rigstead here, Johnny has gone into elementary schools and taught, taught kids. Chile's done a ton of corporate clinics. I've done a couple myself and uh, we get a lot of college scholarships for our players and Brent's got a great, uh, system to get, uh, get them help in, in that education process. And you're going to see in week seven or eight, how we can help you guys know a little bit more about that process, because there's a big learning curve to all this stuff. So um, let's jump into, uh, you know, what this seminar series is all about. We're doing the intro today. We're going to do speed and uh, workouts next week. And then we're getting into long game, some best practices for practicing, basically how you can practice smarter and then some short game stuff rules of golf. And then we're going to get into the last two weeks, which is about how to play college golf. And we'll have, um, Justin Smith and, uh, I'm blanking on her name. Is it, is it real, 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 real. Yeah. Real's the new women's coach at the U she's going to jump on as well. We'll have a couple D two and D three coaches as well. So that'll be a fun one, um, to definitely mark on your calendar as well. Um, so that's kind of our scope there. And we know that, um, as we go, we're going to have plenty of time to answer a bunch of questions, but just keep, keep firing away at us if you have anything. And we'll be presenting a lot of this, but we're also going to involve other PGA pros in Minnesota because uh, our goal is not to monopolize the time. It's about kind of making you better. And if we can get experts in different areas, I think that's a win-win. So a little bit about it. All right, let's go on to next one. So what can you expect? Um, you know, it's designed to serve a lot of different groups of golfers and parents. We want to educate parents too. So if, I don't know how many parents are on. I'm kind of curious, but we want to make sure you guys have a chance to ask your questions, whatever they are. Um, and then you're going to get a lot of variety and different viewpoints. Um, you know, how, how I teach golf is probably different than some of the other panelists here. You know, some people are more technical. Some people are more field based. Um, I think some people do better with the mental game. Uh, some people have a lot of trouble with the mental game. Anybody here ever thrown a club? I mean, we know what it's like, right? It happens. So we need to, we need to talk about all that stuff. Uh, and it's important that we dive in there. So, so what can you do? Well, you can be engaged. You can take notes. You can reach out to your buddies and try to get them on this if you feel like it's valuable. And then as with many things in life, you kind of get the chance to take some notes and be accountable, or you can just let it uh, pass through you, right? So a lot of people will read a book and they don't take notes on it, but we know if you want to learn something, it's better to read it, process it, take some notes, maybe review it even. Um, so I would, I would recommend take a note and it can be like super small. Like you could get a post-it post note like this and just write down maybe the few things that are important to you. Um, and then take a picture of it, put in your phone and think about it or put it on your mirror. So it's super visible. And those things that, that are important to you, maybe you can remember them and, and use them at some time. So um, that's, I think how you can make the most of this. And, and we will certainly um, push you guys every week to have something that you want to work on some, some bit of homework there. So I'm going to ask panelists now um, when you guys are taking a new material uh, like, let's say you guys go to a seminar or maybe you go play around a golf with somebody that's, you know, much better than you. Um, what do you try to learn from that experience? How do you process it? How do you go back over it? Give, give these guys a little cue on how you like to learn. Yeah. I mean, I like to, I take notes 
Um, I t- take notes on every round I play, maybe not to the detail that Mr. Snyder does, but uh, I try to uh, take a lot of notes and um, I read a lot of books and there's a f- few books that I read almost every season before competitive golf. And I read back at my notes and it's crazy how I always pick up something new. So, I mean, the moral of the story is you're always learning, especially in this game, even at our age, um, you can always get better. So yeah, I, I think just be a sponge, learn as much as you can. Yeah. Every opportunity out there is great. Brent, you've played in a couple of really big tournaments. Can you tell us how you've um, kind of work through some of those things and, and learn on the go. Cause it's all relevant, right? Yeah, it is all relevant. Um, I think, you know, the, the scope of the, um, the scope of the event, I think is just an interesting piece as well as we, we end up putting more weight on a certain event because external or internal pressure where we start thinking about it differently because we perceive it as a bigger event. Uh, I treat every event the same. So I try to stay really level and back to the point of learning I mean, every single round. I mean, I'm paying attention to all my playing partners. Um, I want to learn as much as I can. There's things that I see in other people that I'm just fascinated that how it works and why it works and what it does for them. And there's things that I see in people's game where I'm like, kind of kind of glad that I don't have to work through <laughs> some of those patterns. I mean, I'm, I'm going to see both sides of it, uh, but I'm going to learn uh, as much as possible. Now, the note taking that that Scott is referencing for me. Um, yes, we keep track of stats and we do all this. Um, when I'm keeping a, a yardage book, um, I'm very particular on, um, you just create a scenario, it's very easy, right? So on the first hole, the flag is 125 yards and the front of the green is 120 yards. Um, it's very ner- normal, like every single shot for myself and my caddy, I hit my shot and say my pitch mark is that 122, so two yards over the front edge, right? Now, three holes later, I might have a shot that's 126. Uh, As an athlete and as a player, it's far easier for me to get the sense of, hey, I just need a couple more than that shot I hit on number one, right? So I always have those numbers in my book, so I know uh, a feeling. I'm not a huge clock guy. It's I'm not playing in a technique necessarily. I'm not playing in the technical. I'm reacting to the target. But uh, a lot of times it's a lot easier for me to work off of a feeling that I had one or two holes ago rather than trying to put it into some exacting position. As exacting as we try to get in this game, um, there's got to be some other stuff. There's got to be some intangible stuff. But I am trying to learn constantly. Life, teaching, playing every single day. Yeah, it's, yeah it's a- I'll, I'll jump in here for a second, Luke, and Go for it. to Brand's point, when he's getting different yardages, where he's going to pitch the ball in front of the green, I'll notice a lot when watching kind of junior golf, high school, and even professional level, there's things happening in which you can be paying attention to the, the ball mark that's on your line, and there's a, a chance for you to get a view of the putt and how it's going to break, and people aren't really paying attention to that somebody hits a pitch shot, it really takes a firm bounce. And if they're not watching, they'll have a similar pitch shot. It'll bounce too far away. So if you're paying attention, if you're there in the moment, you're going to see a lot of things happen that can really help. And we just want like our theme is to learn and that's how we get better. It's okay to make a mistake. Try not to make it twice. Right. Um, And there's a lot there if we keep our eyes open. So I think what everybody has to say is has just come with a lot of experience and playing. And we really like to help you, the junior golfer, the youthful golfer, how to, how to really capitalize on that. So your games can get better. Scotty, we got a bunch of questions about books. I know, I know. Like every, (laughs) everybody just wants to know what Scott reads. Yeah. So, okay. So I, I, I saw all these and I want to make sure I'm letting everybody know. Um, technically, some of them I don't read because I spend a lot of time in the car. So I listen to audio books on Audible. It's an amazing tool. So my favorite book that I have ever read for sports is The Champion's Mind. It's I use it in golf all the time. Just how you think is everything. And it's about preparation. It's about you should have 
routine. Um, just, you know, it's, it's everything encompassing. You could transfer it to basketball. You could transfer it to anything. Um, I'm also a big fan of Bob Rotella, who's all about uh, the psychology, um, positive thinking. Um, I think uh, this game is full of a lot of negatives and a lot of gut punches. Uh, you can't perfect it. So um, I think keeping a positive outlook is important. I know a lot of these people have, on this panel have told me that over the years. And then um, there was one question about like a go-to for juniors. I think like a really good one would be Harvey Penix, Little Red Book. It's got a lot of little stories and anecdotes about the game. And you don't have to read a 200-page book. It's eat a, read a couple uh, little passages in that, and you can learn a lot. You guys got any? Uh, really good ones or go-tos? Yeah, I mean, those are good. You get into some heavier stuff with the Talon Code. Um, Atomic Habits by James Clear is some really established thinking in terms of motivational and mental work. Really good. Yeah, those are my favorites. Love it. Awesome. Well, I think we got a good good idea of what, what it takes to be a master learner. And, you know, Learning is, is uh, expertise is really domain specific, meaning like you might be really good at one thing and not good at others, but master learners are pretty good at, at learning different uh, in different areas. Uh, and that's what you want to do. Hey, Luke. Yeah. Um, the question there out there from the masses, there likely isn't one surefire way, but is there a quick mindset that can help with anger and frustration? Yeah, I mean, we should definitely get into that. I, I really, I channel curiosity and I look at myself as like an organism out there experiencing something. I'm like, oh God, I hit it out of bounds again. I get curious about myself <laughs> because I'd rather be curious than angry. I'm like, why did that thing go that way? So that's how I do it. But there's a lot of different ways. Learning how to relax your breathing and kind of do self-regulation techniques are really good. Um, Chili, you got any good ones? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you know, I, I would say, uh, uh, yeah, of this panel, I'm probably the angriest golfer and work the hardest to stay calm while I'm playing. Um, if, if, if you're one of the kids out there, this is actually a funny story. I did a nine week program on breathing exercises and relaxation years ago, and I didn't touch a club for, I believe it was seven weeks. Uh, and then I went out on a nice warm day in October and shot my best round ever and actually shot 62 out at the wilds. Wow. So it had nothing to do with, with my swing. Cause I was just happy to be out playing golf. It was a nice fall day. It was 70 degrees out. Uh, but it was, it was, that was a big jump for me because I thought that I had to be perfect with my mechanics. And what I did was spend, you know, six, seven, eight weeks being really perfect with my mind and, and staying calm and just truly just breathing uh, and had, I mean, by far, by four shots, the best round I've ever, I've ever played. So there is, uh, there is a lot of stuff out there on relaxation that, uh, that I can help you with if you, if you need that answered. Nice. Well, I think it's good for all the, all the people that are listening to know that even pros struggle with this. And I think in general, it gets easier, knock on wood. Um, you know, as you get older and maybe your expectations change a little bit, you can relax better with it. But um, it's just about going out there and feeling the feelings and learning how to process it. And it's a, it's a thing you have to practice. So your first tournament, you're going to be nervous after a while um, you tend to be less nervous, but you know, good phrase is you're going to have butterflies, just get them going the same direction so that you can be productive out there on the golf course. And, and you're going to have anger and, that's natural. So feel the feelings, learn how to move on from them. I think is uh, my wife, she's a cognitive psychologist is says uh, tends to be productive. So, all right, let's talk about expertise a little bit. This is a great illustration of a bunch of beautiful golf swings, but uh, I just want to show you how different they are. So you got like Bubba Watson here, who's kind of flipped around. He was, he's not a righty. Um, you see some super high hands. You see some lower hands. There's Rory. It looks like Jason day. DJ with that bowed wrist. Um, I wish I had had some, some women in here, um, but it's just a, a kind of a collection of beautiful swings that are all a little bit different. And um, 
you know, why are they different? Um, Cause it doesn't matter that much what your swing looks like in the end at the top, you know, what matters is near impact. And I think the, the job of a good teaching pro and um, a good player coach relationship is to find out what variables matter for you. Um, but a lot of these people have different ways to get it done. And what they have is they have a great mind that's really geared towards learning and growth. And they just are absolutely doggedly determined to get better every single day. Uh, and so that's, I think, what really determines how good you're going to play and how good you're going to play long-term. So let's look at a couple different different sorts of swings here. Here's Tiger Woods. I think this is a, you know, 2001. He's kind of at his peak. Just a beautiful swing, balanced. Actually had a little more weight shift back in the day. You can see he actually moves off the ball. And he pounded it. He was playing a steel shafted driver, hitting it, you know, 320. Uh, and swing and smooth with great width, meaning that the club didn't get jammed up down there at the bottom. Um, so there is one way to do it. Now, if you ask Tiger who had the best swing of all time, I've heard Tiger quote that Mo Norman did. And you guys probably haven't even heard of Mo. But Mo Norman was uh, a Canadian. I think he was on the spectrum, probably some autism involved. Um, you know, a lot of people report that. Um, he shot 59 multiple times. His name was Pipeline Mo. He'd often joke about, and maybe it wasn't even a joke. He'd he'd often hit multiple flag sticks in the same round. You know, his goal was to hit multiple flag sticks on his approaches, and he'd play rounds of golf in the morning and afternoon and hit the ball in the same divot. So he was just a legendary ball striker. And you could see he set the club a foot behind the ball, and even late in his life, at this stage, he I think he was in his 60s, he hit every single shot pure. And what's interesting is he almost made no divots. He kind of swept it off with a lot of shaft lean and a lot of lateral slides. So there's different ways to play the game. Um, you'll see guys like Bryson DeChambeau have adopted a lot of what uh, Mo Norman did in terms of getting the arms extended, standing a little farther from the ball. So these are, these are not the variables that are going to separate you from being a great player. There are a lot of different ways to get it done. So let's look at... Uh, hey, next. Luke. Yeah. We got a question. Okay, fire away. Uh, uh, what is your recommended uh, or preferential uh, amount of time for playing practice for a 13-year-old? Huh. I think it depends on the mind of a 13-year-old and where they're at. If some 13-year-olds with ADHD need to be on the golf course all the time. Were so, you one of those 13-year-olds? When I was young, I liked to play a lot more, yes. Uh, I switched around and started practicing a lot more when I was about 13, 14, 15. I loved hitting balls. Um, but I think it's different by the kid. The best mix probably is you got to have some range time. Um, but there's one, one thing I think some people forget about is like, if you're playing nine holes of golf, you may not actually hit that many golf shots. So you need to make sure you learn how to hit the ball solid. And often that comes with some just kind of block time on the range, switching clubs but it's all about productivity. So if your mind's not there and you can't focus on the range, get on the golf course. So you guys have an opinion on that? I've threatened at times to go through a season without hitting balls and just do short game and play tournaments, which is not, that's not great advice, is it? It's um, I, I, I don't sit around and hit a ton of balls. Um, I do to, to Luke's point, if you're just playing, I think it can be somewhat limited. Uh, it's very common for me either early in the morning or later in the evening when I'm not working to do my work on course. So if you have that opportunity where you can throw multiple balls down around the green or get on the most uncomfortable tee shot on your golf course and work a certain shot pattern so you can see it visually in the scope of if your end game is, you know, you get a couple people where their end game is to have their golf swing look a certain way. I think everything we're talking about right now is the end game is about getting the ball in the hole faster. So I think a combination thereof, but it is very dependent to Luke's point. Yeah, I'll add into that too. Uh, one of my best seasons in the section, I kind of devoted all my practice to be on course, probably 95%. And like not everybody has that opportunity, but wow, is it valuable get yourself in that mindset is, is quite different from being on the range. But to Luke's point, you definitely have to have some skill building too. But once you're there, get some time on the course. Yeah, it, I think a, a threshold to reach is you got to be able to hit the ball fairly solid. And if you need to hit more range balls to get to that point, you probably need to put in some time. But then it's all the, the term they use in motor learning is called contextual interference, meaning 
making your task hard and getting to that edge of where it's really, really frustrating um, or challenging for you is where you learn the hardest or learn the most, right? So that's often on the course. Go find the lie that you hate. Find the wind that's coming off your back with water to the right. Go work on those shots that are hard. Make it hard for you. So um, depends where you're at. It's all relative to your skill level and also a little bit of your personality. So um, great discussion. Here's here's Nancy Lopez. You know, kind of an unconventional swing before Matthew Wolf. Look at that position at the top. Um, for a stretch, she was the most dominant player in the world by a long shot. Um, and now I'm going to show you, um, just because your technique's a little bit different and interesting doesn't mean it's going to work, okay? So I got to throw in a little comedy here. So don't go work on your swing and do whatever the heck you want and expect yourself to be a player just by practicing. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got for you there. So it's just because we're talking about how flexible motor panelers are doesn't mean you can do whatever the heck you want. Okay. That's why we're here. Find some teachers that know what some of the fundamentals are for your swing. So let's talk about the recipe for greatness. Um, I think it starts with this motivation and mindset and learning how to be um, you can, you can think of it a different, different ways, but you got to have a growth mindset. You got to be one of those people that's trying to soak it up and learn and just experience and grow and get better every single day. And if you have that foundation and that mindset built in, and, and so we break it down into intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, but if you have a lot of motivation, that's the foundation for success. So intrinsic means it's coming from you, meaning like, you go practice your putting or chipping in the evening with nobody around just because you want to get better and you actually enjoy that part of the game, right? Extrinsic motivation is, is trying to get better so that you can go win tournaments. Now, there's an interesting study on giving kids candy for golf performance. And um, we know that if you give extrinsic rewards to people that they are less intrinsically motivated. So one of the things that we don't do in our, in our um, camps is we don't give rewards just for coming to golf because we know that golf's not as fun if you give rewards. Golf should be the reward. You get to play golf. Now, if you're a really young kid and you want to go to the golf course and ride around on the golf cart and have fun with your parents, I think that's a little bit different. But remember that uh, we don't want to suck intrinsic motivation out of anybody. Uh, we want to make sure this game is fun for you to play. And the challenge of learning the game and growing is um, enough for a lot of people. But um, sometimes that motivational piece is it's really important to set up with the right kind of environment. So going on to like the next level here, the physical environment, it's really important to have, you know, resources that allow you to do what you want to do. So I'm uh, at Interlock and, and we have great opportunities. So junior golfers out there have a beautiful golf course. That's very challenging. They have the great practice facilities and those can help a lot. And I think if you look at the PGA Tour, the PGA Tour is littered with people that came from pretty affluent backgrounds, often mostly white, um, and they had great physical opportunities. They also had a culture that kind of promoted a mindset. Um, and I guess, you know, it was a golf culture to them. So they had those, those serious advantages. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, what we call the physical and mental talents. So let's go into talk about those a little bit more. You know, motivation, I, I know this, this is a little deeper than what uh, everybody wants to talk about. So I'm going to go quickly, but it comes down to really three things. This is probably really useful for, for parents, I think. So autonomy means you get to choose your own path and you get some choice of what you're doing. And good teachers will even in, in put this into the lesson. So one thing you'll see with good, good teachers is that they let their players choose some activities that they're going to work on. And they want the player to understand that they have some ownership of the path. And the player is the best when they have basically direction of what they're working on with the coach or coach kind of laying the platform out in front of them. So a good, good coach or teacher is going to say, Hey, we need to go work on that. Um, but what else do you want to do today? And then you go work on what they want to work on. So you're going to work on that as well. Um, second part here, which I think is becoming more and more evident is as we get going in golf is that, it need, you need to be part of a team or you need to be a part of a culture. And we have this idea of what we call like a, a talent hotbed, meaning there are certain places in the world and even in Minnesota where you are filled with lots of people that play at a high level and know what it takes to play at a high level. And they, they help teach each other. You can even think about it around Minnesota. 
Scotty, you were up at Minnewaska. What happened with the Minnewaska girls team up there? Yeah, they uh, they won state five years in a row. It's uh, the old adage, uh, success proves success. And um, yeah, they had a lot of really good gals. I think probably over a dozen that played division one golf, but it was just one of these things where the, the kids coming up saw how hard the other ones were working and uh, the next generation wanted to work even harder. So it's uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. I think, uh, I think they set the state high school league record for, uh, for under par in a, in a 18 hole event. I think as a team, they were four or five under par. I think it might've been broken recently, but uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. And that's just one example of a talent, talent hotbed. And it's all about being part of a team and a culture and uh, parents play a huge role in this. Not necessarily that they have to be pushy, but they make that environment always something that is available for the kids. They give them opportunities. It doesn't have to be fancy opportunities. You don't have to go, you know, play fancy golf courses, but you have to have opportunities to make it happen. And that's part of the, part of the culture. The last, last key piece to motivation is competence, meaning if, if you're not good, it's hard to want to go do it. If you're going to get beat by your buddies, you may not want to play. So we are at Interlock, and we're moving quickly towards a model that develops high levels of competence by the age of 10 or 11, because we know kids often stop golfing when they're 13 if they're not very good. Um, they're going to go find other activities. So you've got to get that skill level high enough that it's motivating at an early age, and um, not everybody has in intrinsic motivation to the level that they can maintain their practice, even when they're frustrated. A good coach can help you work through that, but it is difficult. So, um, you know, Brent made a point about a, a, a habit book, which is a great one called um, uh, Atomic Habits. And, and one thing that I loved about that book is it talks about motivation is kind of situational, meaning like, you know, if, if, if we, here we are in the dead of winter, Maybe you've got a tournament in April or May that you're going to play high school golf. You may not be that motivated to practice, right? Um, now, if it's April 15th and you got a tournament the next day and it's tri-state, you are a lot more motivated. Unfortunately, it's too late. <laughs> you can't learn how to play golf in a day. You can't cram um, to get good at golf. So what does it take? It takes not motivation. It takes habits. And so you have to learn how to create these habits, daily life habits that make you a better player and um, my background with motor learning is it's pretty clear. If you do the right stuff, even a couple hours a day, you can be incredible at this game. If you decide, or you have an environment that allows you to play golf two, three hours a day, you have a very good chance of playing D1 golf. It's like super high. Um, not everybody's going to do it. Some people just don't have the talent. There's something, you know, that we can't control, which is like our anatomy. If you're four foot one, it's a little harder to hit the ball far, right? We know that, but there's so much that we can overcome. So, so what you have to do is build a system in your life that supports productive life habits and golf habits. Parents and coaches are so key in making this all work together. And if you can get that system set up where it's like, Hey, in the morning, I'm going to hit balls in my garage for 20 minutes before I go to school. That's what I see the best players doing. I see them have a life habit that is every day or six days a week and they continue to get better at it. So, um, Luke, yes. What did you do every day before you played a high school tournament? Do you uh, remember getting up in the morning? Well, I think, you know, I used to hit balls in my basement and I had a net in my basement. I would hit balls every day and I would, I would take marker and I'd scribble it all over the golf balls to see where my impact was on the golf club. And I had my golf clubs would get all dirty, but I knew where I was hitting it. <laughs> Those are my habits. Um, let's talk. I'll, I'll go through two, two more little videos here and then, um, and then I'll look for some input from you guys. So let's talk about, um, you know, maybe a wrong place, wrong time. Cause environment is very important in what happens here. <laughs> Just a little comedy guys. <laughs> so that's wrong place, wrong time. He, he's okay. He's, he's okay, okay, by the way. He's actually totally fine. It's just a, just a funny video just to break it up a little bit. Um, and I've got one of the top players I coach here named Caleb Van Ergen. Caleb's a great player. He was going to be um, conference player of the year at the D1 level for Valparaiso. And here's Caleb. This is the last winner. So he's a college golfer. This is quarantine time. What's he doing? He's hitting balls 
into his net at home, but his net is just a sheet of paper or she, a sheet of bed, bed sheet, and he's hitting foam balls, okay? So this is a guy that's, you know, he's a plus four handicap. He practices every day in the summer. It's three, four hours a day, plus playing some golf. Um, does he care that, you know, the pandemic's going on? Of course, he'd rather be out there at the range where it was open, but he's going to hit balls, foam balls into a net, and he's going to work on his technique. Here, we were working on a shoulder plane um, and trying to in improve his sequence a little bit because the shoulders are firing a little bit early and then stalling. So, you know, what I, I would say is the environment matters, but for the right person, you can overcome a lot of the disadvantages you have. And I want you guys to remember that, like, just because it is raining or it's hot or it's 94 degrees doesn't mean you should stop practicing. If you want to be good at this game, you need to practice when it's 94 degrees a little bit, right? So um, I'm looking for you guys now. Tell, talk to me a little bit about your environment and your motivation and how that may influence for you guys. Us or them? You guys. Q yeah. and A. <laughs> yeah. Go wherever you want, Brent. I like it. What are we? What are we talking about? Talk motivation. About motivation. You know? Yeah, let's talk about motivation because I think that's a key part here. Well, I th I think an elite, uh, I think an elite player um, loves the mundane. I think an elite player loves the boring. Um, they certainly don't need to be told what to do. You alluded to this sense of empowerment before, which is which is everything. Um, I, I purposely don't see my students a ton. I limit the amount of time they can actually spend with me. Um, it's massive amount of ownership. Um, I think what's so important is an understanding of your pattern. You go through all those slides and everyone's all over the place doing whatever they're doing. They just get really good at doing them, right? And, and I don't think two people are, are really wired the same or do the same thing. Now there's, there's a couple positions that will help there's a couple spots that you could get into your golf swing to hit it a little bit better. Um, but look, I've, I've had some people that have had some pretty weird patterns and they do the weird over and over again. And they're champions. Um, in general, would you rather have a little more comfortable, confident pattern? Yeah. Things get a little bit easier if it's a little more comfortable. And, but you can, if you can keep doing the same thing over and over and you've got it on repeat and you know, when it does get off and when it does get weird, you know how to address it and fix it, not six holes down the golf course, like immediately. That is a wonderful, wonderful recipe to a pretty high level golf. So with that comes just massive open-mindedness, right? I think if someone tells you, hey, it has to be this way in order for it to work, uh, that would be a scary thing to hear. Um, I think we all do things a little bit differently. I think a great coach is going to find what that is for you and then they kind of hammer that through. Motivation, I don't know. You got to have a great hype person in your corner. Um, you know, family and support system or friends, um, coaches. I, I think you want to have a, you want to have a nice crew. You want to have a pretty tight crew that cares about you as a person and that the score and the result and the outcome are not what dictate you. You know, we we're talking about getting angry and what we get angry about and this idea that my emotional stability is dependent on the shot that I just hit, that could be an exhausting career. I and mean, that seems like a really long journey if I'm gonna hang all my emotions on the shot that I just hit. Because I'm, I'm basically valuing myself based off of where a golf ball went, which in the scheme of things seems a little off track. So I spend a lot of time just talking about that stuff. Does the club face need to get in a little better position once in a while? Heck yeah. I mean, 85, 90%, you guys can correct me, is, is all club face. We talk a lot about club face. I think you really want to stay motivated, learn where your club face is. Yeah, great stuff, Brent. So, so let's talk a little bit about talent. You guys probably know DJ. I think he's world number one. Correct me if I'm wrong, but six foot four, he can dunk a basketball, pretty much flat footed, right? This guy's an absolute freak of an athlete. And he's got that funny move at the top where he bows his wrist. There's another one. Is that a fundamental? Um, I mean, more and more today, we're seeing players like to do that, right? It's a good way to shallow the golf club, right? But uh, GJ's got crazy talent. He can dunk a, dunk a basketball. Guys like that will always hit it far. And next week, we're going to talk about kind of the relationship of power and athleticism and how power is just kind of a known quantity. If you can measure the power in your body, it's going to determine how far you hit the golf ball to a large extent. 
Um, here's a guy, Jamie Sadlowski, 5'10", so not a very big guy, but he was by far the best world long drive player in the world. I mean, he's just crushing it, 380, 400 yards. Um, he decided now he just wants to play golf, right? But he's 5'10". How did he get that background? He played a ton of badminton and racket sports. So I'd already mm -hmm. recommend, like, if you guys want to know some trick for speed, learn how to absolutely move it with, you know, some racket sports. It's a great thing to get into in your off season. Um, but there again, like, is there talent? Absolutely. But is he the conventional talent? No, he's not six foot four, right? Um, here's Ian Woosnam. Less than 30 years ago, he was world number one. And Ian is uh, five foot three or four. Okay, so there's a uh, playing, uh, you know, a dominant, dominant role in the game, world number one, um, pretty long hitter, pretty strong guy, but not very tall. So, you know, think of all those guys out there in the audience. If you're one of those people, where you're not that big. It's not, it's not an end all. You can figure it out. Uh, here's NB Park, um, not particularly tall, not particularly athletic, super smooth, hits it super straight. Um, former world number one too. I think she's five one or five two. So. A lot of different ways to measure talent. And again, it comes back to what is talent? Well, it's probably more about your mind than it is your body. It's going to come down to how are you motivated? Can you stick and develop good habits? And are you hungry to get better every day? That's really the talent that I look for. And, and that's a hard one to measure until you put it on paper and we find out. So, you know, expertise is relatively predictable. This is a kind of a bewildering map. I'm just going to cut it down into a couple things like you could pursue learning how to walk right here and moving from one place to the other and not thinking about it and going through your life and you're going to get a little bit faster at walking or running or whatever it is um, or golfing like you think about some of your grandparents they're not pursuing expertise they're just out there playing golf on the golf course um, because they enjoy it it's a good way to spend their spend their afternoons and it's really good for aging so that's what they're doing they're they're down here they're not trying to develop expertise now, if you're trying to develop expertise, you got to go ahead and find a mentor. You got to go challenge homeostasis, which means go do stuff that's difficult. Okay. Go find ways to make it really hard for you and then set specific goals, intense focus, and then learn how to judge your feedback. You know what Brent said about learning how to uh, understand club face and understand your miss patterns. That's all about really expertise. So everybody's got these patterns that they develop ball goes right, ball goes left. You learn how to solve those patterns. Then you jump off of, you know, Mrs. Havocamp's kind of platform here and you can get good at what you're trying to do. Um, and, you know, a lot of these skills we need to learn from other people. A lot of these we have to learn ourselves, um, but that's what makes an expert an expert. And when you're learning to train this way, it's, it's a mindset of, I'm going to go be uncomfortable. I'm going to go get a little bit frustrated, but I'm going to figure this thing out. That's what makes you really good at stuff. We got to push ourselves and, people tend to be good at pushing themselves in domains that they're good at. Okay. Um, but the best master learners can push themselves at the stuff they don't like. Um, my greatest downfall as a player was that, you know, I liked hitting balls. I actually liked working on my a short game. I never hit the ball very straight, but I liked working on it, but I didn't like working out. And um, you know, I could hit the ball 305, 310, but if I'd worked out, I probably could have hit it 330 and I might've been a lot better or I could have been a lot more stable and hit the ball straighter. So I, I look back and I have a big regret that I didn't do the hard stuff. Instead, I did the stuff I wanted to do. So um, I'm going to ask you guys as panelists, like if I'm going to ask for like a, not that you have to have regret, but are there things that you wish you would have known um, about this kind of pushing your limit and pushing your challenge point that you wish you would have known about your own game kind of going back? Mine, yeah. mine, mine would certainly be speed, similar, certainly speed. Yeah, I go to practice habits. Um, we all use uh, the launch monitors, whether track man or flight scope, and now they're really starting to put games and greens. And if you're standing on the range, just smashing balls without direction, which I did for a long time till my hands hurt, there's a degree of that that helps, but you miss out on those specific skills. And I would take all those hours that I did put in, organize them a little better. That would be a regret for me. Yeah, I think a lot of us chase practice effects. A practice effect is hitting seven iron and seeing it go closer to the target and thinking you're learning, but that doesn't mean you're gonna be better the next day. Learning is defined by 
a relatively permanent change in the ability to perform. And if you can't come back the next day and show you're better, you haven't learned. If you can't show that over two weeks, you haven't learned. Um, and I think often we go out there and we do things that are comfortable. We hit, th you know, 10 three footers in a row because somebody said that we should hit 10, 10 three footers in a row. And I flat out am against that. The only advantage to that is maybe the 10th one matters a little bit more. Um, but I'm all about variable practice and more game situations with better players. It's all about context and challenges. Um, so, Luke, uh, yeah, we got a question. Okay. Uh, is wrestling and hockey good cross sports? I would say any sport that anybody plays is, it, I would never say don't wrestle or don't run cross country because it's good to have passions and, and other avenues. Um, what would you say are the best cross sports? You already hit on racket sports, hockey, baseball. Hockey is the next by far. And it's because I think that trail arm is so passive. And we know that because we teach it all the time. If I get a JV hockey player from Edina age 16 that wants to play golf, I can make him break 80 within a year 99% of the time. Because they've already got the motor pattern for passive release. It's so easy. Um, so hockey's great, but you can be really good at basketball and you'll hit it a mile because if you learn how to jump, you're going to absolutely smash it, right? So um, look, you can do it different ways. There's a lots of different sports. There, there's none that are bad. Um, we can have more discussion about when you may want to choose one over the others. But I would say this, I think there's a myth that you have to play a lot of different sports and maybe make golf a seasonal thing. If you want to be really good at golf, you got to play golf year round. You can play golf and basketball at the same time in the winter. You're just going to hit balls 30 minutes, 40 minutes every day. And you go play hoops for an hour, but you're going to do golf if you want to do golf, right? Um, or at least do the workouts to make sure you're strong enough if you're not going to do that other sport. But yeah, I think I think you got to keep doing it. I don't know if there's any bad ones. Um, if you are going to play baseball, do it the opposite side. So play baseball left-handed and play golf right-handed. Like my kids, I got a three-year-old and a five-year-old. They're going to play baseball left-handed. It's just the way it is. <laughs> I don't want to play on the same side. <laughs> so I put the T. How do I do that? I put the T right next to the wall. So they've got no choice but to stand on the side where they can be lefty. <laughs> There's different ways to figure this out. Um, so let's throw it back at you guys a little bit. What do you want from golf? This is, this is for all the people listening. You know, understand you've got windows of development that will close. If you learn golf at a young age, you can be really good the rest of your life. I know everybody on this panel could not touch a club for one year and not play single round and break 80 with almost any set of clubs. That's how good these guys are. But we put in a lot of time learning how to play this game. If you guys put that time in and let's say you want to go into a business career, you're going to be good at business, right? It's very helpful. There's a lot of advantages for your life, but you got to take advantage of some of these skills. Uh, we teach a lot of guys that come at us age 30 or 40 and want to learn how to play golf. It's hard to get those guys to break 80. Some of them with good athletic backgrounds, if they played hockey or baseball, they've got a much better chance, but um, it can be very difficult. Um, and all these skills you learn, they transfer. They're, they're for life, they're for golf, um, and, and, and they're going to be useful for you for a long time. Uh, you can't expect to jump in full speed. So let's say you're motivated by our chat tonight. I don't want you to go practice eight hours tomorrow. I want you to set a goal for 22 minutes and try to do 22 minutes for the next 22 days and then go to 28 minutes, right? Just build it up. Um, it's not about burning yourself out. It's about learning to make a habit and then learning to get a little bit better at it and getting a little bit more used to the uncomfortable nature of learning because it is always a challenge and, it, and, and that's how you get better. Um, so, you know, think about what champions do. They do what they need to do and, and not all of it comes easy. Um, I love this last line. It's called, you know, it's a good phrase, dogged, incremental, and constant progress till we die, right? And, and you have to kind of be a little bit tough and, and learn how to love that. But um, if you can develop that mindset of, of enjoying challenges, which as a kid, it's not normal, right? That is not normal. But slowly over time, you develop that, that mindset. So another uh, question here. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes it's hard to enjoy golf during competition. Did mm -hmm. one of us write this? Uh, is there a way to do both in an easy way? Chili, have you been writing while you're... <laughs> 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 so, 
Sorry. So, uh, and, and uh, you know, I hate to say this. Uh, sometimes I get asked questions that I don't know the answer to. So <laughs> I, uh, I've battled with this one. Uh, I don't know if, if this was a young kid that wrote this, but uh, if, you, if the outcome and the result means too much, uh, that's a surefire way to be miserable. Um, but I think I'm probably going to have one of the other guys answer how to maybe have it be more fun. Uh, cause I, I truly never found a way for competitive golf to be as fun for me as if I am just out playing with my friends, uh, which I don't have a lot of time to do anymore, but, but, uh, I think it's, that's your expectations probably getting a little out of control. So I don't know, maybe one of you guys take a stab at it. Yeah, I just had a good story from a, a colleague um, regarding Kevin Na. So he just won at the Sony um, down in Hawaii. And some of you may know or may not know that he has a past of just being nervous and, and struggling mentally on the course. And I thought it was fascinating. One of the, I don't know exact details of the story, but they were talking to him about how he can kind of overcome that anxiety and tension and, um, he talks about gratitude and he talked about how gratitude can be greater than that anxiety or tension. That's something we all probably talk about, but I've talked with Brent about quite a bit is that what can gratitude do for you? What can these other things do for you while you're playing? Look, golf is frustrating. It can be challenging. Not every round is going to be fun, but there are things out there that can help you through tough days and then, basically can motivate you to keep going. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, uh, it's, it's all great. It, it golf can't, can't be your identity. That golf ball can't determine how you feel about yourself and, you know, all performance is, is on a bell curve. Okay. So your bad days are like this, they're on one side and then you got a lot in the middle and then you got on the other side of the bell curve is some really good days and you got to find a way to enjoy it as much of them as you can. Right. So, there's, there's, if you think about it that way, if your average score is 94, don't be upset when you shoot 94, <laughs> Just try to learn and get a little better if you need to do that. Right. So, um, there's going to be good days and bad days and you just got to take them all. And I think when you're a kid, your emotions are like this, right. And then you get a little older and it's a little more even, so it gets easier as you get older and you can expedite that with some, some train learning and, and put yourself out there. The more often you do it, the more you stop caring, right? Imagine if you, every time you, you know, you woke up in the morning, you said, okay, I'm just going to go play golf today. It just happens to be a tournament. It doesn't matter. It's just a tournament. I play a tournament every single day. After a while you'd stop caring. Right. So getting yourself out there can help. Yeah. Hey, Luke, yeah. Could I say something? Uh, yeah. uh, about four years ago, I went to Luke to get help about a week before a tournament. Uh, we had our CPC coming up. I remember showing up to see Luke and I'm like, Hey man, what do you see? What's going on? I was freaking out. And he's like, uh, what's up? And I said, I don't know. It's just not right, man. It's not right. So I'm just not hitting it right. And, and he's like, well, you're hitting it fine. It doesn't look any different than it, it ever does. And, and um, so he asked me, he goes, well, what are you so angry about? And I just said, well, I don't know, man. And he's like, what are you expecting to shoot? And I was like, well, 68, because 68 is going to win most days. And, <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, well, what's your average score? And I was like, uh, I think it's 71.8 right now. And he goes, well, then, then make 72 the goal because that's your average. Because you're, if you're expecting to shoot four better than your average and you never do it, you're going to be miserable. So I think that was one of the coolest things I ever learned from Luke. That's funny. Thanks, Jilly. Yeah. Different perspectives. Uh, um, some questions yeah. about uh, winter equipment. Uh, what are some good equipment items for indoor hitting set up for kids this winter? And is there a good indoor putting mat you prefer? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll take a stab at it. You just got to get a net and you got to make sure the net is um, protecting your valuable stuff in your house, <laughs> but you can get a net on Amazon for 130 to 140 bucks. You're good to go. You can get a mat, you know, a couple hundred bucks you're good to go. You can start hitting balls. Now, if you want to take it up a notch and talk about SkyTrack $2,000 machine, that's awesome. Cause you can do simulator golf. You can set that up. If you guys have any questions about setups, let me know. I've done all the research uh, on it. Cause I, um, at interlock and we've got foresight track, man, SkyTrack, everything. 
and I had to review them all. So let me know, just, just uh, email me if you got any questions about that stuff individually. Um, but it's all about just hitting balls every day. It doesn't need to be fancy. And, and if you have a good coach, you can be very productive hitting into a net. Um, it can be very useful. I think you guys agree with that. hundred percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Putting. Do you guys have anything? I mean, for everybody out there, me in the winter, what I do with putting is I picked up this putting mat from Dick's Sporting Goods about 20 years ago. It's literally probably about 15 years old, and I can put six, seven footers on it, and that's all I do for putting in the winter, just work on my stroke. Um, I mean, there's you could spend, just like Luke said with hitting balls, you could spend a lot of money on putting mats and things. Do you guys have one you prefer or recommend? I use a thing called Big Murphy. Um, it was recommended to me from one of my tour players for a winter thing, and it was it was too much. It was too much money, but it's really nice and it rolls like unbelievable. It's like that carpet on. It's like a mat carpet that you would use in a vehicle, like the back seat mats on the floor of a car. It's like that really, really fine felt. It's unbelievable. I just use, it's called Big Murph. It runs at about a 10 and a half, 11 on the stem. And it's unbelievable. Yeah, I, yeah, I was just on a, I'm sorry, go ahead, Luke. Oh, you go, Chili. Uh, I was on a forum on Facebook with teachers that are building simulators in their homes or at their golf courses. And one of the best uh, putting surfaces that all these guys are kind of agreeing on is at Home Depot, there's a, a, it's like a green carpet that rolls at about a 10 and a half. And I think it's like 38 cents a foot. So it's actually pretty cheap. So that's what I use it at my house. I just have a, a 15 foot roll of that that's about three feet wide. And then I have some chalk marks that I try and lag it up to. But that's, that's cheap. That's what I that's have. Way I better than what I did. I've got that in my golf simulator in my garage too. And it's unbelievable. It's like 50 cents per square foot and you could get a strip and lay it down on hardwood. And I do lag putting drills um, all day long with that thing. Uh, or I used to um, get that right distance dial. It's unbelievable. So that's a super cheap solution. You want a big strip and, and we'll talk about games you can do on that and be effective with your leg putting in the winter. Another question. Okay. Should I choose MGA events or players tour events? based off difficulty and cost age I'm, current game yeah i mean those are the questions i have play both you got to get uncomfortable if you've been playing junior pga keep playing junior pga play players tour play multi-day events but throw mga qualifiers in there for the players and for the state am and if your handicap's really low throw in U.S. Junior, U.S. Am, U.S. Open qualifiers, and get weird. Try to get uncomfortable. Yeah, I agree. You just, I don't think you can get better without getting uncomfortable. You have to keep playing, keep at it, keep doing more if you can. Right. You don't have to outkick your, I mean, if you're, uh, if you're shooting a hundred, you don't have to try to play in crazy tournaments. You don't have the handicap to do it, but, but definitely play to a challenging level. And it's okay to play down sometimes too, because practicing Absolutely. the mindset of like when you're expected to win, that's a really cool thing to actually experience too, because you have to go out there and have a mindset of, I'm just going to control this golf ball and play my normal round instead of trying to expect great things. That can be super valuable too. Cause a lot of times people don't play well when they're expected to win. So yeah, great stuff. Um, so here's, here's a little bit of kind of your homework here. I think we got to wrap it up. I think we're at hour 15. I don't want to go too long. I know you guys probably have some homework to do and maybe it's getting a little, little long. It's my bedtime, Luke. I know. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's have your homework. So set some uh, short long-term goals and match the practice plan to your goals. So, you know, Scotty, I know you want to play in the masters at some point, you're going to have to practice a little bit harder. So make sure your practice okay. matches what you're trying to do with it. Um, get a coach, you know, you don't have to see a coach a lot. I think as Brent said, and I agree, um, you want a coach that will see you and help you fix some stuff. But as you're starting to figure this game out, you don't need to be relying on a coach, you know, every day, every week, you can, you can have a coach. You see, I have a couple of players. I see four or five times a year that are really good players and they only see me when they're in a pickle or they need a checkup. So um, don't feel like you're investing a crazy amount of money. And you know what, all, all the guys up here, 
we uh, we're the sort of guys like we want to work with good players. We're going to make it work for you. If money is a, something that is important to you, um, you know, making sure it's reasonable, we'll work with you if we need to, for sure. Again, that's kind of the foundation that we're, we're setting up. That's literally what our mission is to make sure you can have access to good instruction. We do expect a lot from you. And I hope you guys would appreciate that. Like um, I don't often fire kids, but I'll, I'll be flat out like telling you, Hey, if, if you're telling me this is your goal, and this is what you're going to do for practice. I'm going to flat out say, why doesn't it look sharper? Have you been practicing? And I don't want any BS about it. So a good coach is going to help you get there and it's going to help you uh, be accountable. And actually, I think as a parent, like that's what you want. You want, you want valuable um, feedback and you want honesty in that relationship. And if you get those things, you're going to get unbelievable results. Um, so what you need to do is decide when and where you're going to practice and how, how much. Um, doesn't need to be jumping out at Mach 10 and, you know, go to six hours of practice a day, just go with a, a minimal goal and try to build on it. And if it's literally like my head pro Nathan at, at Interlock and says, you got to touch a club every day. If you can hit 10 putts every day, and maybe the next week you start to do 20 putts a day, keep track of them, make it a life habit, start to enjoy that process of getting better. Um, it can really be motivating to see results. Um, so get accountable. What, what gets measured gets managed. One of my favorite drills that I give my players is I want you four times throughout the day, which is really easy. If you're at home, I want you to hit 10 putts and every one of those 10 putts matters. And you keep track of how many of those 10 putts, uh, which are four or five footers are you making? And it's a really fun way to just put it in a notebook and see, are, am, am I improving? So there's lots of different ways to get accountable and set some goals start off a little bit slower and build on it. So, and then uh, you need to start thinking about getting strong and getting fast next week. Scotty and I are really going to hammer on this um, getting strong, getting fast uh, workouts and speed development. Um, we'll talk a little bit about ripstick and maybe uh, maybe how you can get a, a plan for some crazy speed. So that's what I want you guys to think about. And um, what else we got for questions at this point, anything else, Scotty, nothing else out there right now. Okay. Well, I'm going to sign off here. Um, you know, if you guys got any other, other questions about some of the stuff, we can definitely uh, kind of answer it. You know, we've got obviously seven more seminars to go, so we'll be able to cover some of this stuff. But if you guys want to um, throw them out the last minute or two here, you can, or you can um, send us an email. It looks like one more. What's that one? Just thanking us for our time. Thank oh. you, everybody, for coming out yeah. on this inaugural uh, education <laughs> component yes and, and we'd love if you guys could um you can go to impact golf group and check out our website we we are still fine-tuning it you know we're a bunch of golf pros trying to figure out kind of what what our business is going to be but you can check out our website and you can contact any one of us if you're interested in working on some stuff and i think again you guys are going to feel and, and find out that we're pretty honest we want you to win we want you to have success I want you to enjoy the game and and there's a lot that we uh, we just enjoy working with kids it's kind of the fun part of of our jobs i think we all teach adults but motivated kids are pretty fun to coach um any any final words guys just big thanks appreciate everyone yeah thanks for coming on and look forward to next week thanks everybody thank, thank you. you have a good night Oops, I guess we didn't fill this one out. <laughs>